We'll get started. I'm Peter German, and it's my, uh, I'm director of the Kennedy School, uh, and sometimes involved in our capacitor program with Tom and Hamilton, and even with Gail on uh, occasion, going back a year or two. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here to this, uh, I think, quite an extraordinary event. Um, we're privileged to have with us today uh, two lifelong uh, members of the extraordinary struggle uh, for uh, self-determination and the rights of South Africa. Uh, two people who have devoted uh, almost literally every waking moment, I think, and indeed, uh, uh, I think, quite a bit of their uh, active dreaming uh, in their hours of sleep uh, to this struggle. Uh, I'll start with Amit Thrata, uh, known in, in, Cal in South Africa as Kathy, uh, to uh, some of his comrades. Uh, only because his time in the struggle has been longer, not uh, the, I don't think the intensity is any greater. Um, uh, he downplays this, but I'm told that at age 12, he joined the Young Communist League. Um, and he says it was just because it was the only recreational you know, group around uh, that provided opportunities uh, for young, uh, young uh, boys and girls to, uh, to, uh, uh, to get involved. But I think, I, and I ask him, when, when was the dawning of your political consciousness? And, I, and surely it was about eight, right? <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. And in any event, at the age of 14, he joined the party. Um, and I think his life has been an unending and unyielding quest for justice uh, in South Africa. Uh, uh, he was arrested uh, as part of the defiance campaign in 1952. Uh, stood in the dock uh, with uh, Walter Suzulu and Nelson Mandela at that time, not the last time he would stand in the dock alongside them. Um, uh, he was one of the principal organizers of the uh, uh, Clifftown People's Congress in 1955, where the Freedom Charter uh, was, uh, was introduced and, and adopted. Uh, he uh, uh, then was uh, arrested at the Ravonia Farm in 1963, the South African police uh, thought that they were arresting the uh, high command of the uh, Nkonto Osizwe, uh, though uh, I understand uh, he denies that he was then part of the high command. Uh, but they thought uh, in capturing uh, uh, Ahmed Kathrata, Raymond Malaba, uh, Walter Suzulu, uh, Koban Mbeki, Tabo Mbeki's father, as many of you know, uh, and, and uh, a half dozen others, that they had broken the back of the movement. In fact, what they did was uh, in convicting uh, these men, uh, along with uh, Nelson Mandela, in the Ravonia trial, and sending them to Robben Island, and since they created the cell in which the movement uh, grew. Uh, and uh, uh, Thrato was on uh, Robben Island, I think, for 19 years. Uh, 18. 18 years, actually, he could probably tell you to the day uh, uh, there, and was released in 1989, uh, along with the other Ravonia, uh, members of the Ravonia group, uh, save for Nelson Mandela. Uh, since then, he has uh, been a, an active political advisor to the uh, president of the ANC, now state president, Nelson Mandela, and, uh, and is here in part of his capacity as the, the chair of the uh, committee uh, uh, to deal with the issues uh, of, the, of the Robben Island prisoners. Last year here at Harvard, we had the pleasure of, uh, uh, of seeing Danny Schechter's wonderful uh, documentary, Prisoners of Hope, uh, which some of you may have, may have seen last spring when we showed it here. Uh, which recounted the uh, really extraordinary uh, revisit uh, to, to Robben Island, out of which grew the, the movement to uh, provide support to, to many of the uh, ex-political prisoners. Uh, and it's really that effort, an effort to raise funds, that has brought them to the states to support that. Now, this is not, as I explained, a fundraising effort. Uh, this is not a fundraising venture, so we don't, we're not, uh, we probably, I guess we only raise money for Harvard here, so. Uh, uh, but. Uh, but he's uh, been gracious enough to agree to come and uh, share with us uh, both some, some look back at the past and, and perhaps some comments on, on current events. With him is Barbara, Barbara Hogan, uh, who got her education at BITS uh, and as a student was involved in the industrial uh, uh, arts movement, industrial relations movement in the 70s and uh, uh, involved in a variety of underground activities in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, in 19, uh, I think, 80. Was it 80 or 81 you were arrested? 81. 81, she was arrested. She was the first white woman convicted of high treason in South Africa and was imprisoned in 1981 and was released only in, in 1990. Uh, since then, she has uh, worked, uh, she was then uh, secretary, uh, general secretary at the Houting ANC, 
I worked at the Development Bank in 1994, was elected a member of the South African Parliament. Um, these are two people who know the past, uh, and, and what they bring to us today, I think, is, is a little bit of a vision uh, of, the, uh, of the extraordinary past and extraordinary burden uh, that South Africa has labored under. But they're also part of the South Africa's South Africa future, uh, and uh, I think we want to touch on both. But, but no country and no community, it seems to me, can, can grow, can develop until it come, comes to grips with the past. And part of the remembrance on Robben Island is, is, is aimed at doing that. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, Amit Kathrata. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, friends. Uh, just to clarify one point, at my age, I can only deal with South Africa's past. <laughs> Barbara is a youngster, and she'll deal with the future. Uh, there's just one uh, little point I should add, which will uh, reflect uh, our relationship or our connection with Harvard. Uh, when I say ours, I mean the liberation movement. We were on prison trial in South Africa from 1956 to 61. Uh, 156 of us had been arrested in 56, uh, but in the end there were 30 of us left who stood trial and we were acquitted in 1961. Uh, Dean Griswold from Harvard Law School came to South Africa, uh, worked very closely with uh, our defense team. He was not a part of our team, naturally, but he worked very closely with our defense team, together with some other legal persons from England who helped uh, in the preparation of our trial. So we have that long connection uh, with Harvard University. I thought that little bit of information may be of interest. Uh, secondly, I should just explain uh, uh, the, my twofold mission to, or our twofold mission to the United States. The first part was uh, uh, at Michigan, with Michigan State University, uh, where we spent a week. Uh, I had uh, given to Michigan State University copies of my prison correspondence. Uh, and people have asked now, why Michigan? And the simple answer is twofold. Again, uh, firstly, I have a very close friend who is a professor at, uh, at Michigan. Uh, but secondly, and more importantly, perhaps, Michigan State University was the first university in the United States to divest from South Africa. <laughs> and we thought that was reason enough for us to uh, donate copies of our pres uh, my prison correspondence and other documents to the library there. Now, having said that, I don't know what next to say. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, if we want to speak about the 26 years in prison, uh, it'll take a very long time. <laughs> Perhaps I should just mention a few things about Robben Island and and leave the rest of the time for, for, for questions. The other thing I should point out also is that, unfortunately, and I suppose because the president was on Robben Island, and Robben Island gained uh, fame and notoriety, uh, people in South Africa and other parts of the world tend to concentrate on Robben Island. Whereas the facts are that although Robben Island housed uh, the majority of political prisoners in South Africa. A sizable number of political prisoners were not on Robben Island. Now, Robben Island had uh, only black male prisoners, and when I talk of black, I talk of the South African political terminology where black includes uh, Africans, <coughs> Asians, like myself. I was born in South Africa, by the way and uh, what we call colors in South Africa. Only black males, whereas there were a sizable number of female prisoners, white and black, who were not on Robben Island. 
And there were a large number of uh, male black prisoners who served their sentences in other parts uh, of South Africa, in other jails in South Africa. What had happened is that uh, what they considered to be short time, short term prisoners, uh, after 1968 or so, were never brought to Roman Island. They were made to serve their sentences in other prisons. And uh, that constituted quite a, a fair number of, of prisoners. Now, last year in February, we had a major and the only, the first and only major reunion of uh, political prisoners, ex political prisoners. And this event took place on Robben Island. Uh, we had 1,250 prisoners there. Uh, the idea was a reunion, basically. I personally met uh, people there who, whom I hadn't met for 30 years, although they had spent a number of years on the island. But on Robben Island, uh, a group of about 25 to 30 of us were kept separate from the rest of our political colleagues, so that uh, we had instances where uh, close friends from outside spent 10, 15 years on Robben Island, and, and we never sat, set eyes on one another. It's those type of people also we met on Robben Island after so many years. And uh, instances of such reunions were very, very many. So it was quite an emotional uh, experience for all of us there. Now, before we went to Robben Island for the reunion, in the course of our political work uh, throughout South Africa, we had met ex-political prisoners. We had seen the conditions of some of them. Uh, naturally, we were very sympathetic to them. But it is when we saw them as a group that it struck us the utter destitution of quite a few of our colleagues. Some of them had uh, come to Roman Island in tetters. Others uh, were disabled, blind, uh, wheelchairs. One particular person did not even have a wheelchair. He was carried from the ship to the, to the uh, docks to the harbor. Uh, and then there were others who were literally starving. As a result of uh, us seeing that, uh, the conference of ex-prisoners that took place the following day elected a committee of ex-political prisoners, of which I am chairperson. Barbara is a member of the executive committee. And the mandate of the committee was to do everything possible to <coughs> alleviate the plight of the most needy uh, of the political prisoners. So that is the second part of our mission to the United States. Uh, and uh, Sharon Gelman here, who, from Artists for a New South Africa, she and her organization have uh, arranged a, 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 a whole itinerary which will take us to about seven cities <coughs> where there'll be fundraising functions. Uh, the first of which started last night in Boston here. Yeah. Uh, having said that, I suppose uh, you want to hear a little about Robben Island. And I should start off by saying that uh, <coughs> while doing underground illegal political work, one knows that sooner or later uh, there'll be arrests. You cannot hide from the police forever if you are active. But when the arrests came, they did come as a shock. Uh, because once you're underground and uh, you feel safe and secure and you start neglecting uh, security and uh, I don't know how, uh, they managed to find out where we were hiding, but they pounced on us in July of 1963 and arrested uh, members of the high command of Um Kontovi Sizwe, which was the military wing of the ANC. And as uh, 
it has been pointed out I was not a member of the high command, but uh, and the evidence against me was absolutely minimal. But because I was found guilty of a conspiracy, uh, whatever sentence applied uh, to my colleagues applied to me, and I was given a life sentence together with President Mandela and others. Uh, we were sentenced to hard labor and life imprisonment in South Africa for political prisoners, prisoners meant literally life imprisonment. Whereas the common law prisoner uh, in South African prisons was considered for release after 10 years and the majority of them were in fact released uh, after 15 years. With us, uh, we spent 26 years and the president spent 27 years in prison. Uh, and it was a life imprisonment with hard labor. But it wasn't all uphill. And that's something that we should point out. Human beings were being where they are. Uh, once you, you are there, and neither us nor the enemy could maintain a relationship of constant antagonism, hostility. Uh, they had to, to adjust, to make adjustments. Uh, so that uh, there were periods of relaxation, and when they found out, when the higher-ups found out that there was too much relaxation, they suddenly removed the soft ones and, 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 and fly in uh, the tough ones from criminal prisons, and life would become a bit more difficult again, but that's how it it carried on until our, our release. But to start off with, uh, I should start off with uh, briefly a little anecdote and friends of ours who have heard this before may close their ears. Uh, I've said it so many times, but I think it's, uh, it's worth repeating. When we were arrested at Rivonia on this farm, uh, we were placed under solitary confinement. The law of the time provided for detention without trial for purposes of interrogation. Uh, in fact, they were trying to extract information from us about the activities of our colleagues and ourselves, of course, and of the organization, which had been declared illegal. Uh, under that law, the detainees were kept completely incommunicado. Uh, no visits from anybody. You kept in solitary confinement. The only persons you saw were your warders and the security police who came to interrogate you from time to time. No other contact whatsoever with the outside world. And the only reading matter they gave me, for instance, was the Bible. Uh, soon after our uh, detention, uh, we managed to establish illegal communication with the outside, and uh, news started trickling in. But by that time, incidentally, we were not even allowed to talk to one another, those of us who were arrested together, although we were in cells next to one another, but we were not allowed to speak to one another. Uh, it was during that time that the first killing in detention took place. Uh, under, uh, under this 90-day law, the police uh, killed the first person in detention, and we got that news. And every other bit of news, or most of the news that came from the outside at the time was gloomy and, and frightening. Uh, so that we went through a terrible period of anxiety and, and fear. Uh, you have sleepless nights as you get bits of news. And as I said uh, to friends last night, in that situation, one thinks of nothing else but oneself. And during that period, my colleagues, two of them, who were living next to me, who were arrested with me, I noticed that their hair was turning white by the day, but I couldn't speak to them. Uh, not allowed to speak to them. And this increased our anxiety and our fear. 
sleepless nights, and you kept on asking yourself, have my colleagues broken down? Have they talked? Have they, if they have talked, have they said something about me? Which may mean that the death sentence is coming nearer to us. And those are the type of anxieties that one has uh, when you're locked up in your cells with nothing else to do. You pace up and down and worry about it. And this carried on and the hair turned whiter and whiter <coughs> until one day we got a chance to, to communicate. And then I discovered, much to my pleasure and relief, that all that had happened is that the black hair dye had turned white. <laughs> so that was the 90-day detention. Of course, it wasn't all that easy. You, they did try everything possible to attract, a, a, extract information from us. Uh, they'd use all sorts of methods. You had the soft one who'd come and uh, talk very softly to you. And the, whole, the line was, why are you not cooperating? Your friends are talking. They're giving us information. It's all not true, of course. But uh, that's the type of... And they used the racial, uh, the racial angle. Why are you protecting the Jews? Why are you protecting the Kafirs? Which was the derogatory term for Africans in South Africa. Uh, you're a decent man. Well, why are you protecting them? And then, of course, you don't talk, you don't talk, and then comes the tough one. And he comes just near to assaulting you, but he doesn't. That is, at least our, as far as we were concerned. Uh, that did not apply to other political prisoners, of course. Large numbers of whom were tortured. And as I said, uh, under police detention, over 100 were killed since 1963. But we were not physically uh, tortured. Anyway, the 90-day uh, period ended, the period of interrogation, and we were brought on trial, which lasted almost a year. Uh, and uh, perhaps I should say one word about our prosecutor, uh, a Dr. Utah, who is Jewish. I say that because the Jewish Board of Deputies uh, sent a message to us uh, distancing itself from Dr. Utah. He had gone out of his way to get to the Minister of Justice to take this trial to prosecute us because he had a mission in life and that mission to, was, according to him, to vindicate the Jews, that not all Jews were terrorists. Because a fellow accused among us happened to be Jewish, two of them. And uh, so Dr. Utah regarded this as his mission to, 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 to vindicate the Jews. Uh, we met him a few months ago. The president, uh, as you may have read, invited him for lunch. I was there, and uh, Dr. Utah, of course, suffers from selective amnesia. Uh, <laughs> he has forgotten all the viciousness with which he conducted the trial. Uh, we appeared before the press together, and he pointed to us as evidence of how good and how fair he was. Uh, but we did not reply, of course, but uh, other lawyers uh, did reply to him in the press afterwards. However, we then landed on Robben Island. We were flown to Robben Island on the night of our sentence. And here I just want to say a word about the viciousness and the inhumanity of the apartheid system. As I said, the whites were not with us on Robben Island. There was discrimination as between white and black, but there was also discrimination between black and black. Uh, in our group, the Rivonia group that landed on Robben Island, I was the only non-African, and I was the youngest of the group. And uh, we had to get into prison clothes. Uh, it was bitterly cold in Cape Town in, on Robben Island, winter month. Rain, cold, wind, all together, very miserable. And I was given uh, long pants. My colleagues were given short pants. 
right through the winter. Now that was in keeping with the philosophy of white South Africa. All Africans, regardless of age, were boys or girls. Uh, that was common terminology. It still is. It's getting less, but it still is quite common. So that Mr. Mbeki, who's 20 years my senior, Mr. Mandela, who's 11 years my senior, as far as the prison authorities were concerned, they were boys. And they had to be treated as boys. Boys wear short trousers. They were not given socks. I was given socks. Uh, and as a concession, they were given shoes. Uh, according to regulations at the time, they should have been given sandals, generally made of tire. When it came to food, there was discrimination again. Uh, in the morning, all the food was the same, a dish of porridge, uh, soup, coffee. But the African prisoners were given less sugar than us. Lunchtime, uh, boiled Mealies, as we call it in South Africa, I believe we call it corn. For the African prisoners, we were given a more refined form of corn. In the evening, the African prisoners were again given uh, porridge and soup, but no coffee. We were given bread, soup, and coffee. African prisoners were not allowed bread. Uh, a year or two thereafter, they were allowed bread, but they were allowed to purchase one loaf of bread a year at Christmas time. <laughs> and the meat and the, and the fish ration, again, they were given less than we were. So that from the word go, it was a continuation of the struggle on another terrain. And the first reaction, of course, was to reject this superior uh, food, if you can call it that. But uh, our seniors, uh, Mr. Sulu, Mr. Mandela, persuaded that it would be wrong politically for us who are more privileged to now demand a diet on an equal basis, but at a lower level. <coughs> they said we should fight to have the same diet at a higher level, not. And in retrospect, they turned out to be correct because one of the Robben Islanders wrote a letter protesting against the discrimination and promptly came, he was a colored man, promptly came back the reply from the authorities, if you are so concerned about the discrimination, just make a written application, we'll reclassify you a Bantu or an African and you'll get the same treatment as the others are getting. So prisoners have got very few avenues of protest. This includes uh, uh, representation naturally to higher authorities, to visiting uh, dignitaries, uh, boycotts, and most of all hunger strikes. Uh, and we had a series of hunger strikes and such activities. We managed to equalize the clothing in about three years three, four years, but food took much longer, and we managed to equalize it after a decade, well after a decade, but it was all equalized. So that's just an example of the racial discrimination. We were sentenced to life imprisonment. They had made it clear to us in so many words that their mission was to crush our spirits and to isolate us from the entire world, from our own people, so that in five years' time, as they said, nobody will remember the name of Nelson Mandela. And they set about it to do just that. Newspapers at the time were not allowed to publish anything about prisoners or prisons. It was a, a criminal offense. A, 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 a political reporter of a newspaper was jailed for publishing something. So the media were not allowed to publish anything. We were allowed letters, one letter every six months, 
uh, incoming and outgoing every six months, and we were allowed to write only about family affairs, what they called family affairs. We were not allowed newspapers or radios or anything. So they really tried to cut us off from the world and induce this amnesia among the people. Naturally, uh, they did not succeed. We had to set up illegal machinery to, 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 to carry on um, uh, getting news from the outside, uh, newspapers and so forth, and we begged, borrowed, stole, bribed, blackmailed, everything. But we did keep, keep ourselves informed. And because we were isolated from the rest of our political colleagues, we also had to keep in touch with them through illegal means and, and which we did. Now, I don't want to go on anymore. Lastly, the President's autobiography. You may remember, those of you who have read it, that autobiography was written in prison. Again, illegally, clandestinely. And the process was he would write whatever, 10 pages, 12 pages, whatever. He would then give them over to me for my comments. I'd then read the, them to Walter Sasulu for his comments, and I'd write down his comments as well, hand them back to the president, and he would either uh, accept or reject our comments. Uh, the final manuscript he'd do and pass it on to Two of our experts on our uh, two of our experts on our illegal communications committee. Now these were experts in very tiny handwriting, uh, and they were also experts in uh, concealing these things because the whole idea was to smuggle this out of prison and out of South Africa. These two gentlemen, Mr. Lalu Chiba, who served uh, 18 years with us, and Mr. Mac Maharaj who served 12 years, who is presently the Minister of Transport. He transported the illegal stuff out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so he got a suitable position <laughs> in the new government. Anyway, they concealed, uh, uh, they, they reduced 500 odd pages of uh, the biography into about 50 or 60 pages of very tiny handwriting, concealed it, they, they, they actually constructed a photo album. Uh, it was so perfect that nobody could have seen that this was constructed in prison. It looked like a genuine factory-made photo album. But what it did have is thick covers, and these 50 to 60 pages were concealed in those covers. And the arrangement was that as soon as Mac Maharaj, who, who was released in 1976, as soon as he succeeds in getting the stuff out of the country and safely in England, he should send me a postcard uh, to, you know, with some wording which I'd understand to say that that is safely out. We would then destroy the originals which were buried uh, in, in, in our garden in plastic containers. So we got this uh, message from Mac that everything's safe, but because again we felt very secure and we left it in the garden, we thought we'd destroy it one day until one day they suddenly started building a trench to build a wall and they came across uh, what we had hidden. We managed to retrieve a few of that beforehand but the rest was caught and we were punished, the three of us, Sasulu, Mandela and myself. The punishment was that we had used our study privileges for doing things other than studies. Namely, we used a ballpoint and paper to write a biography that is other than studies. And the punishment at that time was that we were deprived of our privileges to study. There was no time limit. We had uh, lost the privileges before, uh, and the, uh, this time uh, it lasted for four years. Uh, and then, of course, we were allowed to study again. I think I should end there and leave it. I already have spoken too much, and I think uh, we should leave it to questions, and Barbara may will have to add something <laughs> about uh, the women's experiences in prison. But we'll come back to questions a little later. Yeah. I always admire Cathy's modesty when he says... Uh, he was sentenced to life. What he neglects to say is that 
If he'd appealed, the lawyers were of the opinion that he would have only got 10 years and would have won his appeal, and he refused to appeal because there were only two people who were not African in the Ravonia trial, and he felt a commitment to non-racialism. And so he refused to appeal and sat 26 years in jail as a response. I'm not going to talk about the woman's experience in prison. I think people will want to ask questions. It was different, um, and, and we can follow that with questions. I also want to talk about what's happening in the country now. Just to say that the women's experience was very different to the men's insofar as we were never a community as people were on Robben Island. Robben Island was at least 60 to 200, 300, 400, 500 people. We were always a small group of about three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And in that situation, you suffer real social deprivation because you're actually living in a group, you're not living in a community. If someone irritates you, you've got to live with those irritations. You can't get up and move off. You can't choose your friends, you've got to learn, you've got to learn to be kind, you've got to learn to be tolerant. But you, you lose the interactiveness, you, you forget how much different people bring out different parts of you. Each, every person brings out a different part of you, and you're limited to what those couple of people can give you. And I think that is a different aspect of the experience, and I think we need to, to look more at what happens to small groups of people in jail, because that is often a very difficult experience as well. But I want to talk a bit, as Cathy says, he's, he's an older generation, I'm a new generation, I think he's been very, very flattering, but anyway, I want to talk about snippets of the new South Africa. Now, as he was talking, I was remembering that Robben Island reunion, and isn't this the new South Africa? Here we are, all 1,300 of us, who the state saw was the most dangerous people that they had to sentence over the years, on the South African Navy's biggest ship, which was actually built by the Soviet Union, which we got after the ANC was unbanned. So there is the South African Navy proudly parading a, a ship from the Soviet Union who they swore they would never have anything to do with in their life. And we set up on deck, this beautiful deck, and the Navy has been so thoughtful. They've put sun shading on. We've got these tables with white linen. We've got urns. We've got teacups. We've got chairs. We have this royal view of the whole harbor of Robben Island, the lot. And you have all these old gentlemen, many of them sitting in corners, slapping each other, because there's a lot of camaraderie amongst prisoners. You know, you've been through a lot together, your old friends, your old chums. And this incredible interaction and and, and bars and talking and catching up on old times. And then suddenly you see strange things happening in the side. You see these young white Navy officers, all dressed up in their uniforms, queuing to get signatures from Tokyo Sikwale, one of our Robben Island prisoners, is one of our most popular black premiers in the province. And you think, what is happening? This is just a total change. And these are the kinds of snippets of a new South Africa. I mean, snakes here has been very centrally involved in drawing up the new constitution. And there are endless stories to be told of the new South Africa and the old South Africa confronting themselves across tables and having to deal with each other, negotiate, bring about a new South Africa. And I was struck in this last series of negotiations, there were two teams of ANC negotiators, I was part of the one team, that we'd sit and talk English while we were having the, 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 the discussions. But as soon as we broke for breaks, we'd be speaking Afrikaans to them. And that is the kind of way in which we met each other. And I think it was a very useful. And you can see the way that it started to work on people's minds. Uh, there's one Nationalist Party MP that we had to deal with, who's this very jolly, portly person, with uh, quite a long beard, big rosy cheeks, and he was being called Colonel. And one of the Democratic Party people said to him when we were in the passageway, so were you a colonel in the security police or the army? No, he says, I've never been a colonel in any of those. He says, so who calls you a colonel? He says, it's the ANC. I say, why do you call, they call you a colonel? He says, no, I'm Colonel Sanders from the Kentucky Fried Chicken, they say. <laughs> <laughs> and he was very pleased with it. <laughs> and those are the snippets of a new South Africa. It's snippets, too, also of the pain, if you look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There are these moments, on the one hand, where you can't believe what is happening. It is a miracle 
it's deeply moving. And you sit and you listen to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and you cannot believe that people could ever have done this to people. And the pain, and this attempt, as Peter said, of coming to grips with our past, trying to find out where we are, trying to chart a way to the future, trying to deal with each of us with our own personal insecurities, our heritage, our past. And that is a mix and a blend that I think is in New South Africa at the moment. The, the miracle, I think, is that we have been able, by and large, to stabilize the situation politically. I think that's been the great significant achievement of this era. Uh, from, you know, one would have thought with the unbanning of the ANC that would have led to, to the stabilization of the political situation. Certainly not. Because then every dark force descended on that society afterwards in the forms of third force violence. Anyone who wanted to wreck what was happening put all their energies into doing that. And we've more people died in the period after the ANC was unbanned in 1990 than had ever died in South Africa before. It was train violence, it was people being killed on trains, massacred in the streets, houses burnt down. It was a very dark period. And uh, that period is now inevitably coming a thing of the past. Even in Guazulu Natal, where we've had the most serious violence, it is very, very much on the back burner. Part of the reason is that I think we have been able to, to deal with the armed right wing, the white right wing. Even days before the elections, they were planning armed insurrection. I think the ANC in taking seriously what their fears were, instead of just responding to the manifestation of the fears, but looking at the heart of those fears, which was what is going to happen to our ident identity, the ANC took it seriously, listened, and have provided ways for them to approach the question in a constructive way. That has disarmed, and I don't just mean in the military sense, but in a very psychological sense, that right wing. It's astonishing to sit in Parliament now with a Freedom Front, whose leader, General Constant Fulhun, was a person who was the leadership figure. And to see that he's probably one of the most constructive critics of the ANC in these days. He's regularly met by a president. And you see in him and in the Freedom Front themselves an acknowledgement, a tacit acknowledgement, and I can't say it out loud, that their dream of a small white colony somewhere is unrealistic, but that they realize that they have to bring their people along with it but they're not prepared to shed blood anymore for that. And you see a sense of white South Africans on the extreme right finding a home for themselves. And I think that is to the leadership of people like Comrade Cassie, Nelson Mandela, these, these giants in our struggle who have set a leadership pattern which has been simply astonishing. So politically, I think we have made it. I mean, it is extraordinary to say it. It's wonderful to see, to see children growing up as children and not having to carry the burden of a political struggle on their shoulders anymore. Where we're facing problems is that we're facing the aftermath of a society that was literally brought to the brink. If I feel anger, I don't feel anger against individuals. I feel anger at the intransigence of that government who a decade ago, even at the, uh, in the early 80s, should have acknowledged that they were going nowhere. But in that stubborn intransigence, they caused an escalation of struggle to such a point that by 1989, South African society was rapidly tearing apart. The social fabric was being torn apart in every way. Kids weren't in schools. There was no control over children, no discipline, and I, I'm not putting this in a harsh way, but people do need to realize the problems that we experience. There was just massive, unparalleled unrest. And whilst that had the good side of bringing about transformation, it had its downside. And that's what we are facing now, normalization. It's not just political stabilization. We have to normalize the society. Nowadays, when people say to me, you know, I don't want to be in politics. I prefer to be a journalist, or I'd prefer to, to be a lawyer, a company lawyer, I say, great. 
For too long, we've been too massively a politicized society. We've not allowed people the opportunities to be themselves, to give expression to themselves. And our society has not provided that opportunity, and this is, I think, where we are going now. Normalization. Crime has rocketed. And this is a manifestation of all that was happening in the 80s. You cannot expect crime not to have rocketed if during those 80s the police were using criminal gangs to do their work. You arm people who are immoral and ruthless. You get them to train their guns on others. It's a very short trip down the lane where they don't start using that for their own advantage, and that's what we're facing. We're facing the after effects. We're facing a, a corrupt police force who has never ever really dealt with crime seriously. They were a political force. The resources that went into criminal investigation were zilch compared to what went into the political security police. And so we're having to reshape the whole nature of law and order without becoming a reactionary fascist society. And that is difficult. Because whilst we are having to deal with law and order, we are also setting up these great institutions of democracy. And I don't say that they necessarily contradict, but it's one of the, 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 uh, the, the parts, the contradictions that almost you have to, to straddle in order to understand the new South Africa. We're also having to deal with the issues of delivery. People brought us in, the ANC in, a government in with high expectations. And here the, the progress depends on what you're looking at. We've done very well in some areas. Some areas we, we're managing, other areas we're not managing. Water, electricity, we're doing very well. In 1995 alone, we supplied electricity to over 300 and, and close on 350,000 households. Now that's enormous in, in South African scales. <coughs> we have a, a, a parasitical that's able to, to manage very well, water as well. We've been able to move very fast in the provision of water supply. Housing has been a particularly big problem, partly because we have been relying on the private sector to come in in partnership because we do not have the resources of government to provide the housing. And one of the legacies that we have is that the private sector is not keen to come in the low income end of the market. And we're also having to deal with the bond boycott inheritance that we had from the 80s, so we have hesitancy. We have now reformulated our housing policy for the state now to provide rental housing stock. So we're having, as we are finding difficulties and blockages in delivery, we're having to assess and start unblocking those blockages. I think housing, particularly with the assistance from the trade unions who've made, Kusat has made a very timely input on that. I think we are now getting on our road. Justice as we're trying to totally transform the justice system. Now, I mean, maybe I shouldn't go into every aspect, because just bear in mind that there's not a single nook and cranny of South African society that isn't in the process of transformation. Most legislatures pass six or seven pieces of major legislation every session. We are just enacting major legislation almost on, 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 uh, on a daily basis. We have white papers, policy papers on every aspect of South African society just being churned out. You cannot keep track. We're having to transform labor. We're having to transform the economy. We're having to transform justice. We're having to transform the police. We're having to transform urban government. We have, I mean, it is there. Part of the reason why there's so much pressure on us to transform is because we inherited so blatantly an unjust system. It was an apartheid system, and it was very clear. It was black and white. And if you're going to have credibility as a government, you must be seen to be tackling these, tackling these issues. So we are running 700 different horses at the same time, and there's no ways that you can put them in sequence. Obviously, we are having to reach a stage of prioritization, and we are now in the process of working out now that we've got certain groundwork, foundation legislation in place, we're working out the priorities through a medium term expenditure framework. So with deliverables, I'm not going to go in further. I'm sure there'll be questions. Finally, I would just want to say a little bit about the truth and reconciliation process. I think it has been astonishing to see people coming forward and being accorded their human right and dignity to say what happened to them. This was never accorded to people in the past. They have attracted wide followings. The hearings are held locally in different areas. The hearings are always jam-packed. Uh, it receives wide media coverage. 
and it is a very moving and, and, and also a very difficult thing to just have people there not being cross-examined, not being questioned, but for once in their whole life being able to say it as it was. The other, and I think that is a very healing process. On the other hand, we are looking at the question of people confessing to what they're doing. Initially, it was, it's been quite rough going to get people to come out. The process is now beginning to unravel, particularly now that you have the Commission of Police, Johan von Ameva, coming forward and starting to pinpoint that these decisions weren't coming from rogue elements in the police force, but were actually coming from the cabinet, the apartheid cabinet, and he's now fingering people. This process is now beginning to unwind. What's been quite interesting is how some people, some people, yes, are using it just to save themselves. We've had instances just these last two weeks where one of these police officers came forward and just started crying. Just, and it was almost a Vietnam syndrome coming through. You know, we were brainwashed, we didn't know. So you're going to have different kinds of responses. The Truth Commission is just part of that thing of dealing with our past to heal the fabric of the society. So I'll leave it at that. Suffice to say that transition is never easy. It's probably your toughest time. There's a lot of insecurities, there's huge demand, there's burnout, there's creativity needed like you never thought you would ever need in your life before. But suddenly you have moments where you say, pinch me. There are my ten clauses in the Constitution. It will be there forever. And you just suddenly realize what you're doing, and I think that's what makes it such a magical time in history. Thank you. and then we're going to uh, adjourn to reception so folks will have plenty of opportunity to uh, to talk to our guests. Uh. Well, Bob, Mr. Kapitan, let me first uh, start by saying that the you know, inspiration to all Africans, uh, not just South Africa, so just let you know that all Africans are national terms to all and uh, this kind of all support as well. Now, I have a quick question for you. You mentioned the fact that uh, some of the prison authorities really try to crush your spirits on a daily basis by keeping it solitary confinement as well as methods. How did you keep your spirits up? What did you do to sustain your spirits during that time period? The second part of that question is, being in incarceration for 28 years, coming out and seeing the new South Africa, what was it that shocked you most? What were the differences that you saw between South Africa in 1963 and South Africa in 1989? I'll start with the second question first. Uh, we were given newspapers for the first time after 16 years, but as I said, we managed to smuggle news, so we kept ourselves fairly well informed. And after 22 years, 23 years, we were allowed television. So that lessened the culture shock, uh, because we did start seeing something of the outside through television. And yet it did not completely eliminate the culture shock, and I cited uh, when uh, it was announced that we were going to be released, we were not given a, a time when we were going to be released. Uh, on a Saturday night, the 14th of October, uh, half past 10, uh, we were told by the prison commander in Johannesburg, I have just received a fax from Pretoria to say that you'll be released tomorrow. And our question is, what is a fax? <laughs> so it was quite a while we, we while it was not such a great culture shock there were scores of things that were new to us I had a little hobby where I made a note of things that were new I filled about eight pages of it new technology, new terminology etc etc unfortunately I, I, I gave that up because I still come across new things uh We managed, we didn't get a chance to adjust because the word has spread that uh, we were going to be released at some stage and a whole week before our release, day and night the, the, the newspapers were at our homes just waiting for the release. Uh, and we were released at half past five on a Sunday morning, but within minutes the hundreds of people were there and, and from then onwards, I mean, we faced the the booms, which we've never seen before, this television booms. We saw television, but we didn't see television cameras and, <laughs> and all those things. And we just didn't have a chance to 
to adjust to anything because from the word go, uh, what was supposed to be a press conference turned out to be a mass rally and we had to face television, the media, everything and daily there were meetings and we just adjusted uh, slowly to, I don't know if we still have adjusted. <laughs> but uh, how did we keep our spirits alive? Uh, first of all, when, as I said, when you are doing illegal work as all of us were doing, you know that you can never go on forever if you are active. You are going to be arrested someday. Our organizations have decided that some people should go abroad because we were already illegal. Some people should go abroad to set up the, the organization and others should stay in the country to do political work. So we stayed in the country, some of us, to do political work, but we were hiding from the police. But we knew we were going to be arrested. So you're psychologically prepared for this. We had been to prison before, a lot of us had. So we knew what the inside of a prison is. But perhaps most important of all is the knowledge that is with you always that you're in prison as part of the same struggle against apartheid, against injustice and racialism. The same struggle which your colleagues and your comrades are conducting outside under more difficult conditions. We're in prison, we are protected. Hardest things may, may have been, but we were protected. We knew of colleagues of ours who were killed in detention by the police, who were tortured Colleagues of ours who were killed in combat with the enemy, in armed combat. Colleagues who were killed by parcel bombs, but, uh, letter bombs, etc. So there were always people worse off than us. That helped. And then, of course, we constantly got news of the struggle outside, which was, although they had more or less crushed us in the 60s, but it was, there was a revival, and we got news of that. That the, that the organization has revived. That our armed combatants were infiltrating the country, successfully carrying out their work. Many of them were being arrested. And as Im equally important was the knowledge of the whole world being behind us. Now, as I said to another audience here, I don't think in history there has been a single struggle which enjoyed the unanimous support of the whole world, as I was said. And that knowledge filtered through to us regularly. Those are things that kept our spirits alive. The knowledge that we were going to win. We never ever imagined that we'd be sitting in Parliament. We never imagined that President Mandela would be President of the country, unless he kept it very close to his heart. <laughs> but nobody even talked about that. What we knew is that the ANC was going to win one day. That day came sooner than we all thought. But that's what kept us alive. to, we had our former Minister of Defence on trial for, the massacre, for a particular massacre and he was acquitted. And what is our response to that? We follow our, minister, our President's response in saying that we accept the judgment of the court. Now the reason why we're saying that is that we cannot at this stage in South African history start saying we accept this judgment and that, not that judgment, because what we are trying to do is to develop a respect for the law. But we are by no means <coughs> saying that this is the end of the, the process or for Magnus Malone. Because immediately that that judgment came through, 
The Truth and Reconciliation Commission came out with statements and saying, well, they are taking the investigations further. And what this court case has proved to us is, as justice usually is, if you have six very well-resourced lawyers who can defend people, your evidence has to be pretty good. And a court case is often a reflection more of the quality of evidence that is brought and the quality of the defence lawyers than, than the actual issues of justice. And I think it vindicates our position that going the way of the courts to get at the truth is not the way we're going to get at the truth. So Magnus Milan's story is by no means ended. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission has a hell of a lot of power. They are now subpoena, they're going to subpoena people like Magnus Milan and get information from them. They have their own investigative units. They're not letting anybody know what they know. And Magnus Milan knows that if he doesn't come out with the truth and the truth emerges, he can then stand trial and there'll be no amnesty for him whatsoever. So in a, in a sense, the, the verdict was not unexpected because we had a fairly reluctant uh, prosecutor and it was only when he was put under enormous pressure that he actually started uh, 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 the, the case. So I think it's, uh, you know, what we're saying is that the truth process where you're not putting, where you're putting, getting people there to confess and to tell all is a much more appropriate process than, than, uh, than the uh, courts of law at, at this stage. So let me take one more question, and then they, uh, they have some slides that may uh, show Robin Island, and we might want to take a look at those if we break in the middle of the break the reception. Uh, um, do you have a moment? Um, a colleague of mine was recently on Robin Island, and she told me a story about uh, seeing some prison staff from a mainland prison come in, um, taking snapshots and sort of flash of peace signs in the Kremlin in President Mandela's cell. And I was wondering if people could turn, in, turn Robin Island into a national monument. Well, what this story represented to me was that was that sort of easy reconciliation came to this prison staff while they were sort of sort of dismissing the truth of what happened to, to President Mandela and to the rest of your colleagues in that prison. And I was wondering if you think that turning Robben Island into a monument risks turning it into sort of a picnic ground um, and you know where where people aren't really required to remember the legacy of apartheid cruelty. I hope I've understood your question properly. Uh, first of all, a national, uh, Robben Island has already been declared a national monument by the government. At this very conference of prisoners that we held last year, a very strong view was expressed that there should be no vulgar commercialization of the island. I am chairman of a, a cabinet committee uh, that was entrusted with the task of, uh, of getting proposals for the future of Robben Island. And uh, we have over 200 proposals that, that, that we are dealing with now, uh, ranging from uh, the monument is going to be there, a museum rather is going to be there. I mean, that's taken for granted. But there are proposals ranging from uh, uh, a, a distance learning institution on the lines of the Open University in Great Britain, uh, but not a tertiary institution, something uh, more basic adult education institution with the aid of television and radio. Uh, ranging from that, there's also a, a suggestion from the Nordic countries uh, that there should be a peace and reconciliation institution. And those are among the proposals that we are dealing with. I should say that this miracle that we talk of, the miracle of South Africa, reconciliation, we cannot talk about it without talking about Robben Island. Uh, because unlike uh, uh, the world outside prisons, there was a constant situation of confrontation and conflict. <laughs> There was the enemy on the one side that was the liberation struggle on the other. There was never a gray area in between. But not on Robben Island and not in other prisons. Both from the point of view of the prisoners and the enemy, there had to be confrontation and cooperation to make your lives less intolerable. There had to be that. 
It's not something that we had to sit down and take resolutions on. It came naturally. When you deal with human relations, these things come naturally. You can't be fighting every day of your lives. The warders realize this, we realize that. And that's why it was not surprising that the whole negotiation process leading to reconciliation started in prison. It is not surprising that among the first participants from the other side in the negotiation process, that is before it came out in the open, in the government team, one of the participants was the commissioner of prisons, with whom we had worked for some years while he was a uh, uh, head, uh, head uh, uh, commander of Roman Island. So that this whole reconciliation process did start there, and the first step uh, towards reconciliation was taken by President Mandela while he was a prisoner at Portsmouth Prison, separated from us, of course, for reasons that can now uh, be obvious. They didn't give us those reasons at the time. But uh, that, I hope, uh, answers uh, what you wanted to know. I don't know if I got your question correctly. Well, to clarify, I was wondering if, if people were making it, making it a, a public monument for people who are on holiday and so forth, is risks trivializing what happened there? No, we, that is why we have, uh, I should have added, no vulgar commercialization and no trivialization. Uh, there have been some proposals, fortunately, very few. Uh, someone talked of a children's playground uh, uh, there, uh, which can be taken seriously uh, if it's not uh, a vulgar thing. But at the moment, we have not finally decided on any of these things. We are considering all this. We are, We've had public participation. We'll put our fi final proposals before the public as well, uh, before decisions are taken. Oh, join me in thanking Amit Dvara.